Pastor, you're muted. Thanks a lot. Yes. Um, yeah. Probes 1, 7 and Probes 9, 10 uh, talk about how uh, knowledge begins with a reverence for the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom is what we learned. And then in Proverbs 9, 10, the latter part of the verse, this is what it says. It says, knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Understanding comes when we have a knowledge of the Holy One. And uh, the Hebrew word used over here in the Old Testament for this word knowledge is the term da'at. OK, so once we have a da'at of the Holy One, then we will understand. Uh, so what exactly does this term knowledge, this term da'at, what does it really mean? Um, now, when the Greeks came along, you know, for them, knowledge was all this um, high intellectual uh, revelation uh, where they would understand uh, concepts which common man will not understand. And so for them, this whole uh, idea of knowledge was something very elite. Uh, but you know, the Greeks were nowhere around when, you know, when Proverbs was written. And back then, knowledge was something very practical. It is not just some theoretical thing that you, uh, you know, um, conjure up in your brain and you, you know, boast that you're better off than others. That was a very, very simple, practical, experiential, personal thing. For instance, you know, when it says uh, the, 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 this word that is something that people would use in for everyday things. For instance, a farmer, when he says that he knows farming and he says that he da'at farming, he's not saying that he's gone to agricultural college and, you know, uh, learned about uh, farming. It is something that he starts learning from the time that he's a child. He goes to the fields along with his father, you know, along with the elders of the family. He observes how they are plowing the field. He observes them planting it. He also joins with them. They ask him to help. So he starts, you know, um, even as he's little, he, you know, starts following them, starts doing what they are doing. He begins to discover how this whole farming gets done. He observes in what seasons they are planting what particular seeds. He observes the weather conditions and he observes that the, the, the crops are responding to one particular kind of weather conditions. And then he asks himself, how come the crop this year is better than the crop last year? What are the, what are the variables which have changed? You know, uh, as the water supply changed, have the fertilizers which we have used this year changed? All of these things, he's examining this whole process of farming and experientially discovering personally for himself what farming is all about. So the word da'at is a very practical word, which uh, means knowledge which is gained out of personal examination and knowledge which is gained out of experience. So you observe something in detail, you examine it from all sides, and then you begin to gain a revelation and understanding of what this thing is, how it is done. And so that very practical word, da earth, is used for knowing God as well. So here it is not at all an intellectual knowledge of God. It is, it is you tasting the Lord on a day-to-day -day basis. As you are tasting him, as you are experiencing him, you begin to understand him more. And you discover, oh, this is who he is, is it? So your knowledge of God and Satan's knowledge of God are completely different. Satan can write a perfect, wonderful thesis on the holiness of God, and it will mean nothing to him because it's just head knowledge. You and I, on the other hand, we may not, you know, have as much brains as him because we were created, you know, indifferently. But our knowledge is deeper, richer. Our wisdom is greater than uh, Satan's wisdom will ever be. So because we are tasting him, experiencing him, learning him on a day to day basis. And as we are doing that, we begin to absorb his nature. Uh, his nature begins to rub off on us. So. That is why it says over here so beautifully, the whole process begins with a reverence for him. 
the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom and this dart of the holy one is understanding even as you begin to examine him and test him and taste him and find out about him and walk with him you will begin to gain an understanding of this lord and it becomes a very personal relationship uh, so that leads to um, you know holiness because now you are gaining a daat of the holy one you also will start uh, imitating him and becoming holy so um, that is why it is very important to us uh, how we see god um, different people depending on their needs will worship one type of god uh, what do i mean you know if a person is in need for them god becomes you know mainly yahova ire okay all they can think of is yahova ire the other aspects of god don't really matter that much but he is the ire he is the provider he will take care of my needs he will help me so what happens is now they are focusing on just that one aspect of god and they miss out on all that he is they their um, their entire theology of god revolves around this provision god providing god taking care god make you know meeting uh, their needs and providing supplies he basically becomes a supplier or he becomes a santa claus and you don't really owe any allegiance to santa claus i mean he comes he delivers his gifts and he goes you know you just have to say thank you to him and that's the end of the story you don't need to uh, become a living sacrifice and offer yourself as a sacrifice to santa claus on the other hand you know uh if it is uh, uh, the god of the bible that you're talking about a lot more is involved than just him being yehova ire he is also kadosh holiness he is very holy and so there is something more expected so a lot of christians end up with this uh, theology of god a god who is just a santa claus and so their allegiance to him is very limited he provides you say thank you 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 know you make a contribution in the church you give some money you know you give a few uh, lakhs and say here lord you did this for me now i'm repaying you but when you so which is why it's wrong it is dangerous to just focus on one aspect of god's nature now holiness is an aspect of god's nature which touches all of his other aspects because you see god is good and why is he that good because he is holy he will never be unfaithful god is uh, all powerful how does he use his uh, power you know um, uh, does he use it to manipulate people does he use it to you know have his own uh, selfish interests met no he is holy because he is holy he uses his all powerfulness only for the best purposes so all aspects of god nature god's nature are colored are shaded by his awesome perfect holiness so rather than you know just focusing on one aspect of god which you like or uh, you know focusing on just one um, uh, you know one facet of uh, of his nature rather if we begin to embrace his holiness and begin to gain a daat of it then automatically we realize that uh his holiness in fact touches all aspects of his nature okay his goodness his omniscience um uh, you know his his power all of it it's is touched by his holiness so he is excellent in all of his other aspects all of his other uh, all the other aspects of his nature because he is holy and uh, this can be very comforting to us you know because uh, we talk about the faithfulness of god right and then when things don't work out for us we've been praying for something for years and years and we still don't see it happening and we wonder why why is god not answering why is god not fulfilling his promises we can remind ourselves and say ha ah, his faithfulness is completely colored by his holiness because he is perfectly holy he will be perfectly faithful it is true that right now i have still not seen the deliverance that i need but he is holy because he is holy his goodness is 
colored by his holiness his love is colored by his holiness his holiness means that he is perfect because he is perfect he will definitely do what he has promised he will keep his word so holiness is one aspect of him that uh, literally cover uh, shades and um, you know uh, flavors the rest of his uh, the other facets of his nature so it is so important for us to grasp this particular aspect of of god's nature uh, now what exactly do we mean by holiness uh, you know when i post your notes later on in the day uh, you will see that uh, there's a list of things given about what holiness is holiness is absolute sinlessness it means that absolutely nothing sinful can even touch god you know because uh, um, that is holiness holiness is complete absence of any kind of sin holiness is absolute truth not even one shade of deceptiveness or lies is there in god's character because he is absolutely holy so he is also absolutely truthful and then it goes on to say that you know he is absolutely faithful that is another aspect of his holiness uh, holiness means being absolutely just absolutely no injustice in him holiness means that he is absolute love because no hatred can be there if there's any hatred in him uh, you know except of course hatred towards ungodliness um, then it would mean that he is not perfectly holy so absolute love is 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 an is an aspect of holiness absolute goodness because there can be no un unkindness in god if there were even a little bit of unkindness in him it would automatically make him less holy but he is perfectly holy which means he is also uh, perfectly kind so uh, holiness is also absolute sacredness uh, nothing profane can be part of that Abs so basically holiness is absolute perfection our god is absolutely holy and absolutely perfect so all of his other characteristics are perfect because if, if if he was lacking in any of those characteristics in any way it would automatically bring down his holiness by a notch because he's no longer perfect right so but that is not the case he is absolutely holy so he is absolutely perfect so which means all other aspects of his nature are perfect in every way so because he is that kind of a god we can really trust him we never have to worry that when we put precious things which are important to us in his hands when we sacrifice those things and put them in his hands and say okay lord have your way and not mine we can be sure that he will be perfect in dealing with that you know he will give us what is best for us we can have that deep assurance um so uh, john puts it this way in first john 1:5 um this is the way he describes uh, god's holiness even though he does not use the word holiness over there uh, this is what he says in first john 1 verse 5 if we could have someone read out please first john chapter 1 verse 5 this is the message we heard from jesus and now declare to you god is light and there is no darkness in him at all yes there is no darkness in him at all so um it's it's like a completely spotlessly white garment even if there were one tiny little spot it would no longer be perfectly white so in god's case it's not that there is not even one little spot not even one little blemish in any aspect of his nature because if there were then automatically it would mean that he is not absolutely holy but scripture declares that he is holy so therefore uh, we have to um, you know accept the fact that there is no lack in any aspect of his nature all right um yeah coming to this word kadosh what does it mean and um, how can it uh, you know help us to understand the holiness of god better um if someone could read out maybe exodus chapter 25 verse 8 
Exodus chapter 25 verse 8 mm -hmm. and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Okay, so over here, the word used over here is kadosh, which basically means holy. So the word holy is used for God's nature. He is in nature holy. The place that he chooses um, uh, you know, to make his habitation, that also can, has the same word being used. Uh, you know, uh, in the NIV will call it sanctuary. And then um, uh, some versions will call it holy place. But it's the same word. God is Kadosh. The place where he dwells is Kadosh. And uh, um, uh, the the when, when he sanctifies you know his people, that also is Kadosh. So that word basically is means something unique, something that is set apart. So the word Kadosh literally means something that is other, something that has been set apart. So God is completely other. He is something completely perfect, not like the created things which he has created, which have limitations, restrictions, and all of that. He, on the other hand, is unique. He is set apart. He is perfect. He is ultimate in, every, in everything, in every way. That is who he is. So he is Kadosh. And the dwelling place that he too asks the people to you know, make for him, he asks the Israelites to prepare a sanctuary for him. That also is literally Kadosh. It is set apart. It is meant to be perfect. It's meant to represent, represent him. And then we, the people whom he sanctifies, the people that he sanctifies for himself, in the same way, they are also meant to be unique, set apart for him. They are not like the world. They are not meant to be like the world. They are meant to be like him. Okay, so uh, the word kadosh has this uh, sense of something being completely set apart for him, dedicated to him, and we are supposed to be that. Uh, the Greek equivalent of that is the term um, hagios, and that word hagios is used for uh, believers. You know, we in English we keep using the word believers. So if we were, uh, you know, in Greece, we would be all we would be calling ourselves hagioi, hagioi. So the believers, that word believers, it actually it, it literally is the word saints. So we are all, um, you know, either kadosh according to the Old Testament Hebrew or in the New Testament, the believers, the saints, um, the word that is used for them is hagioi. We are all supposed to be set apart. To the Lord, uh, we are supposed to be the holy ones. So we are supposed to carry in us uh, the nature of God, uh, because the essence of God is holiness. Um, so there are. Uh, so we have uh, two kinds of holiness, which is generally seen in the church. There is true holiness, and then there is uh, cultural holiness. What happens is a lot of people just end up with cultural holiness in the sense uh, when they come and they join the church, they look at the people around them and uh, they pick up mannerisms, uh, they, they pick up speech, uh, you know, uh, from the people around them. And so in the same way other people are behaving and acting, they also try to imitate that so that they also can fit in. And so they end up with a cultural holiness. You know, so um, uh, when you meet another believer, you're not supposed to say hi. You're supposed to say, praise the Lord, brother. You know, so uh, stuff like that. So it's, it's just something that you're picking up from the people around you. And uh, so you look holy, you sound holy, but it is just a cultural holiness. So if you are in a church where people are, uh, you know, um, very uh, spiritual and uh, they are genuinely concerned about the things of God, then the level of holiness in that church will be at a higher level. And then, uh, you know, you will have to uh, maybe raise your standards a little bit to come up to that level. OK, so um, uh, you can't speak any way you want. You can't you, you can't use curse words. Uh, you can't uh, dress up in, a, in, a, in an indecent manner. 
uh, you can't do all of those things because now this church which you're attending has got a higher level of uh, you know holiness being displayed and so you need you you kind of you know readjust yourself to that so depending on which church to go you go to uh, you end up with a certain uh, uh, brand of holiness but uh, that is not at all the kind of holiness that god expects what God expects us is, is that irrespective of the kind of culture that you have been placed in, you imitate him. You choose to do what pleases him. You live in a way that honors and reveres him. So that would be true holiness, where you are trying to have the nature of God. You are not just readjusting yourself the way you speak, the way you dress, the way you know you present yourself, just based on your the cultural setting, because that will keep differing. You go to one church today, you you, you are the people over there are a particular way. You go to another church over there, holiness has got a different meaning. There maybe they need to take off their shoes. Holiness is you got to take off your shoes at the entrance and then enter inside. That is holiness. So these are all outward mannerisms. So if you're only looking at the people around you and saying, OK, compared to them, I am holy or unholy. These are all just human standards. And all you end up with is a cultural holiness, which uh, is of no use when it comes to your relationship with the Lord. So we choose rather to make God our standard. So we choose to have his nature and be like him. Now, only if we are like him, then we can call ourselves truly holy. So the, the, to the extent to which I have my nature has become like his nature, I am only holy to that extent. It is not important whether I'm removing my shoes or wearing my shoes and walking into the sanctuary. It is not important whether you know I'm um, uh, dressing up in a particular way, uh, you know, wearing only white clothes and then entering the church. All of those things will not determine how holy I am. Only one thing matters. The standard should be the nature of God. To what extent have I um, become participant in the nature of God? Only to that extent I am holy. Okay, so um, our standard should not be cultural holiness. Our standard should be the Lord. The extent to which I am confirming to his character, to his nature, to that extent, I am holy. That's the way we would need to measure ourselves. Because if we start comparing ourselves with other believers, um, then we end up with a wrong standard. We may think, OK, fine, they are in this particular way. I'm a little better than them, so I am holy. No, that does not help at all. We would need to have his standard. We need to, we need to ask ourselves, to what extent is my character like God's character? And only to that extent, I am holy okay that helps us maintain the right standard regarding holiness okay let's come to another aspect of holiness um you know as we just this is an introduction and we're just going through different aspects of holiness um what does the scripture say about holiness in exodus chapter 28 verse 2 if we could have someone read out exodus 28 verse 2 please Exodus chapter 28, verse 2. Make sacred garments for our own that are glorious and beautiful. OK. Um, now, if we were to come to NKJV, I think I'm not particularly sure which version I've written down over here, uh, probably NKJV, uh, you know, where you have the more literal translation, you know, word-to-word -word translation from the Hebrew. It says, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, why? What? Why should you make holy garments for him, for glory and for beauty, so that glory may be reflected by them and beauty may be reflected by them. So holiness is something which displays glory and it displays beauty. So when we look at the holiness of God, we are seeing His glory and we are seeing His beauty. Um, uh, Psalm 29, verse 2, if someone could read out. Psalms 29, verse 2. 
give unto the lord the glory due to his name worship the lord in the beauty of holiness okay so here it talks about the beauty that there is in holiness so holiness is something beautiful okay uh, in the same, the same thing again in psalm 96 uh, verse 9 it says worship the lord in the beauty of his holiness tremble before him all the earth um and uh, so um this is how you know uh, the notes explain it we use different metaphors to describe different aspects of god's nature uh, so uh, the metaphor used in the scriptures for god's power is generally the metaphor hand of the lord you know wherever it talks about the hand or the right hand of the lord it's basically talking about his power uh, where it says the eyes of the lord it talks about his knowledge you know the eyes of the lord they roam over the whole earth he knows everything he's all knowing uh, in the same way the ear of the lord is basically him hearing our prayers and answering them so whenever it says the ear of the lord it be talking about you know god hearing us and responding to our prayers when we say face of the lord uh, we mean the presence of god um, it talks about how he, uh, he either causes his face to shine upon someone or he turns his face away from them in the sense he, he cuts them off from his presence um, so these are all the metaphors that we use and look at the metaphor that is used for holiness you know like we saw in the scriptures holiness the metaphor that is used is, is beauty so the beauty of god is called holiness so holiness is something that brings out his splendor it brings out his excellence and his grandeur uh, uh, and uh, so it is the holiness of god which attracts uh, people to him okay so more than anything else it should be his holiness his grandeur which attracts us to him okay so um now um what else can we look at there are so many things in the notes so i'm just try trying to you know figure out what to focus on um exodus 15 11 it says who among the gods is like you lord who is like you majestic in holiness awesome in glory working wonders so here god's holiness is described as being majestic uh, that is it is very high uh, it's it's so high that it, uh, we cannot attain it on our own okay so uh, we see those things um then yeah he uh, he is also perfect and just in all that he does uh, we already looked at that uh, then um, Romans eleven twenty one and twenty two. If someone could read out, Romans eleven twenty one and twenty two. Romans chapter eleven verse twenty one and twenty two. For if God did not spare the original branches, He won't spare you either. Uh, Notice 22? how God is both mm -hmm. kind and severe. He is severe towards those who disobey, but kind to you if you continue to trust in His kindness. But if you stop trusting, you will also be cut off. Okay, so there is a balance between uh, the kindness of God and the sternness of God. Why? It's because of His holiness. Because He is holy, He is kind. He is merciful. but because he is holy he must also punish sin so he also needs to be stern so because he is a holy god there is a balance between his kindness and his uh, sternness so those who choose to repent and those who choose to follow him and accept correction from him he is kind towards them on the other hand if someone chooses to ignore uh, his instructions and no they choosing to rebel against his holiness he has to be stern with them because uh, he has to um, to make he has to maintain his holy standards he cannot you know uh, ignore his holy standards and so uh, we have to be conscious that um, when we are talking about the holiness of god we will experience both sternness and kindness depending on how we are responding to his holiness um so yeah obviously holy, uh, he, because he is holy we cannot ignore uh you know the sin in our lives he does expect us to uh, repent 
uh, Romans 2, 4, it says, uh, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? So God shows kindness towards us in the hope that we will uh, you know, come to him, accept correction, and repent. And when we refuse to accept this kindness of God and we go on abusing his kindness, then, of course, it turns into sternness. Uh, he is forced to uh, punish us and discipline us. Now, there's one question which people raise. They say that, you know, if God is so loving and merciful and kind, then why does he send people to uh, hell eternally? You know, why not just for a few years and then after that, you know, he can just let them out of hell because they would have suffered enough. So if he's that merciful and good and kind, why does there need to be an eternal hell? You know, it's the question which they uh, ask. Uh, but, you know, it's very clearly explained in scripture, the whole um, background regarding hell. Uh, if we were to look at Matthew 25, 41, um, and yeah, if, if, if we could have someone read out Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire, prepare for the devil and his demons. Okay, so the eternal fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was never prepared for the humans that God created. Humans chose to go and end up in it. Uh, but God never actually originally meant hell for uh, you know, uh, humans whom he has created. It was uh, the eternal fire was created. It was prepared originally only for the demons and, uh, and, and the fallen angels. In the same way, again, in Ezekiel 33, verse 11, God says, as surely as I live, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. So God has, uh, does not desire to send anyone to hell but because he is holy because he cannot um, you know lower his holy standards therefore he must address sin so if people refuse his kindness if they refuse his patience uh, and you know they continue to abuse his mercy then a time will come when he has to be stern with them um if uh, someone could read out as Psalm 85, verse 10. Psalm chapter 85, verse 10. Unfailing love and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Yes. So... The righteousness, the complete, you know, the holiness of God, which he expects uh, people to have in them, that righteousness. And on the other side, the peace of God, where he is willing to, you know, put up with imperfect people. These two have come together in Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, uh, he was able to give his perfect righteousness to us because we are imperfect on our own. He gave his perfect righteousness to us. And because he gave his righteousness to us, now we can have perfect peace with God. So in Jesus Christ, the righteousness and peace have kissed. They have met together. Uh, and uh, so we can have perfect peace with this holy God, even though we are imperfect, because the righteousness of Christ has been imparted to us. So. Any believer who chooses to mock this, this righteousness which has been so freely given by Jesus Christ, if they choose to continue living in sin, continue abusing the, the, you know, the second chance that they have been given, if they continue to do that, Hebrews 10 verses 26 to 27 say, uh, this is what they say. So if someone could read out Hebrews chapter 10, 26 to 27.
Hebrew chapter 10, verse 26 to 27. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. Okay, so uh, this is like a warning, you know, to all believers because of the holiness of God, we cannot ignore uh, uh, sin. Uh, we have to repent. And if we deliberately keep on sinning and we are ignoring this uh, righteousness that was so freely given to us and the grace of God, you know, which has been um, revealed to us, if we ignore that, then uh, we would reach a point where there is no sacrifice for sins which is left. Okay, so uh, there are the uh, kindness of God and the sternness of God are held in balance because God is holy and he cannot lower his standards. Okay, so um, now coming to the last you know, portion, uh, we will look at some uh, responses from scripture of people uh, who had an encounter with God's holiness. Uh, and uh, to begin with Jacob, you know, he's... Um, he, he is going to his uncle's place and on the way as he's traveling, he sleeps in some location and he has a dream. And when he sees the dream, he is very afraid. And this is what he says. Genesis chapter 28, verse 17. Someone could read out 28, 17. Genesis chapter 28, verse 17. Yeah. But he was also afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. Okay, so um, uh, language changes as generations go by. So now uh, the word awesome has highly positive connotations. Uh, but over here, I mean, if you were to look at another version, uh, you know, which brings out the, the correct translation uh, in a way that this generation can understand it. He actually says, and he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This, um, when, he, when he caught a glimpse of the holiness of heaven, he says how it filled him with dread. It filled him with fear uh, because he understood that, you know, God is extremely holy. And then we see another example of a response uh, that would be Exodus chapter 3, verses 4 to 5, where uh, you have um, Moses, you know, um, God approaches Moses through the burning bush. And uh, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, God says, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. The same thing again we see with Joshua when he has an encounter with uh, with the commander in chief of the lord's army uh, which you know they say is probably jesus who appeared uh, to joshua so joshua 5:15 there the commander of the lord's army says take off your sta sandals for the place where you are standing is holy and joshua did so so uh, these are all um, instances uh, given in the scriptures where holiness is portrayed as something uh, to be something that that is uh, that is something something that is so intense that humans find it frightening and god expects us to uh, approach his holiness with a very reverential attitude so in two instances where he says take off your sandals as a symbol symbolically to show that you are respecting who he is okay so um, we also have Moses, uh, you know, who catches a glimpse of God's back, you know, uh, even as he's uh, passing uh, by uh, when he requests, you know, when Moses requests that he wants to see God, uh, that would be in Exodus chapter 34, verse 8. And it says that God's presence passes by. And even as God, God's presence passes by, what is Moses' immediate response? It says in Exodus 34, 8, Moses bowed to the ground at once. That's the word used over there. He bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. 
we also have examples of Ezekiel, Daniel, John, um, you know, who fall down as if they are dead. That's the wording that is used, right? They, they fall to their uh, fall to the ground as if they are dead when they have a revelation of God. So all of these responses, basically, why, why do people respond in this way? Because when they have an encounter with God, they realize that whatever goodness they have achieved so far, uh, it is not enough. It is nothing compared to, um, it, 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 it is not enough. It is not sufficient compared to the level of God's holiness. And which is why, you know, Isaiah, when he has this encounter in Isaiah chapter 6, he is uh, overcome. He must have been a very holy man, right? Uh, because uh, he was a godly person and uh, God gives him this vision. So he was a holy and good person. But when he has this revelation, uh, this is his response in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verse 5, where he says, Woe to me, I am ruined. So all of these people, in all of their responses, one thing that we see is the minute they have an encounter with God, they realize that they are inadequate. Whatever they might have achieved so far, whatever level they might have reached in their spiritual life, they immediately realize that they are that what they have is not enough. So here is a man like Isaiah who must have been quite holy, but when he looks at the holiness of God, he says, I am ruined, is the wording that he uses. He says, I am destroyed because he is not um perfect okay my computer is doing things yeah all right uh so so in isaiah's case the revelation he sees is of god seated on his throne and uh, uh he addresses him as adonai that's the word that isaiah uses in isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 he says i saw the adonai okay i saw the lord exalted seated on a throne so he does not just see god as someone uh, as someone who will provide for him and take care of his needs he recognizes the lord as adonai uh, someone to someone who is a master someone who needs to be worshiped and he also sees that the train of his robe filled the temple okay so um, we will maybe look into the details of that in the next class okay so we will we will begin next class with a slightly greater elaboration on this whole isaiah 6 passage um you know uh, I, what isaiah sees how he responds the significance of some of the wording that is used over there and then from there we will get into part two of the holiness of god so which would be next session so these two sessions have been devoted to understanding the holiness of god a little better and then after that, we will look at why we need to be holy. Okay, so um, um, no questions were asked during today's class. But then in future, you know, please feel free to ask any, uh, you know, uh, clarify any doubts that you may have regarding this subject. And uh, we'll close now with a word of prayer. Um, so yeah, let's just close with a word of prayer. We thank you, O Lord, for all the things that we could cover today. Uh, we got a brief introduction into who you are, your nature. And Lord, uh, once we understand who you really are, it would fill us with awe and reverence. And it, we would become very aware of how inadequate we are um, before you in your presence. So I pray, O oh Lord, that we would always walk with this deep awareness of who you are so that all the choices that we make in our life will be ones that honor you, O oh Lord, so that you will be glorified in a way that you deserve. So that, And I pray, O oh Lord, that um, you would begin to mold and shape each one of us, O oh Lord, all of the students, all of us who are part of this course. Help us, O oh Lord, uh, by beginning to shape and mold us uh, into your nature. I pray that this course will not just be an intellectual exercise, but Lord, we it would have practical implications for each one of us where, oh Lord, you would lead us into 
uh, a higher level. Wherever we are in our walk with you, you would cause each of us, O oh Lord, to walk into a higher level with you. So I pray, O oh Lord, that by the time we finish this course at the end of four months, we all would be truly changed and become better. Do that, O oh Lord, for every one of us. You make the lessons meaningful, O oh Lord. Let your presence, O oh Lord, make a difference in our sessions. So we call out to you, O oh Lord, and we ask you to work in us, to work in this course, to cause this course to be useful. We commit ourselves into your hands, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for staying till the end. There were some who went away. Maybe they had other responsibilities. But those of you who stayed up to the end, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, see you next Monday. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor.